Uh, my name is Ariel, and I want to go to college after I finish school to be a dental hygienist. I want to go to college to be an airplane technician. When I grow up, my dream job is to be a teacher. Become either a veterinarian or a physical therapist. Forensics or a psychology. I know I want to attend a university in Texas. I plan on going to college if I get through high school. I want to like explore the world and like write in some journal and show it to my boss. After high school, I plan on being an electrician. I want to become an anesthesiologist. At the moment, I'm not quite sure what college I want to go to, but those are my goals. Where we stand today at almost 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm having a hard time figuring out how we get to the point where we restore the $5 billion that we took from our school children last session. Article 7, Section 1 starts by saying a general diffusion of knowledge being essential to the preservation of the liberties and rights of the people, comma. That is the reason we have public schools. That's the why literally everything else is the how. Our social contract that we have with each other as citizens is that we will secure the collective welfare of our citizenry. We've always had that since the beginning of our democracy. Early on, it was determined that if we're going to have a stable and self-sustaining democratic order, we've got to educate our children. Education is at the core of the common good. We have to understand that there are proposals floating around that could drastically change the face of public education. And it's important for people to know what's at stake. Otherwise, they'll look up one day and those public schools that they've always counted on will have transmorphed into something very different that they are not going to want. It disturbs me greatly to see people trying to destroy public education. And make no doubt about it, they are trying to destroy public education. I support good education, first and foremost, and education for the child. What I don't support are failing schools. I object to the whole notion of a failing school, rather than saying, gee, maybe the cuts that we made to public schools have hobbled their ability to get every kid to meet the academic standards. There are five million children, and three of them live with me, and they're all waiting for somebody in Austin, Texas to stand up for them and uphold the Constitution. Not geothermal, where does thermal come from? The most important gift of all is knowledge because nobody could take it away from you, and teachers offer that to you. It's the opposite to what? What angle are we starting with? What's our reference angle? What angle are you starting with? We have to be that opportunity for students and their families so that they can realize whatever dreams they have and also generationally change the face of not only that family, but then our region, our state, and our nation. It is the single most transformative, publicly provided benefit to our community that can truly make a difference in how a community is gonna progress in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. The trouble with schools is that it costs money and it's public monies and the payoff doesn't come until 20 years down the road. That's where leadership comes in. That's where a growing understanding across the board of what does the 21st century represent? What does it mean? Forces for 400. Force that pulls all objects in the universe towards the center of Earth. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, up. 50% or more should say what is gravity or gravitation. February, March, April, May. Oil. 
Uh, Chairman, I thought in the interest of time we'd dive right in. Uh, on Saturday, the Dallas Morning News and other news organizations reported that Texas is now 49th among the 50 states in the District of Columbia in per-student spending on public education. Only Arizona and Nevada are worse than we are. And Chairman Aycock, is that something to be concerned about? Absolutely, yes. We, nobody enjoyed making those cuts last time, and I think to the degree possible, we'll try to reverse some of those this time. Chairman Patrick, do you believe that we cut public education too much last session? You know, that's in the eye of the beholder. Well, I'm asking you. You're yeah. beholding. Tell and, us what you and, think. And here's what I hear from the public, and here's what I hear from the business community. Uh, everyone has a stake in public education. Uh, everyone wants the appropriate amount of funding in areas of need. Heading into the 2011 session, the state was dealing with a, a very deep, deep deficit. It was clear that from comptroller's estimates that we were not going to have enough money to pay for all the things that we had paid for during the previous session. And public education is something that takes up the most of the state's budget. So what happened during the 2011 session was that $5.4 billion was cut from public schools. But at the end of the day, the people of Texas want a budget passed. And this is a good budget. And on the last day of the legislative session, Senator Wendy Davis uh, filibustered a, a, a bill that was key to the budget passing um, because of, of the cuts that were in it to public education. Buyers ISD will lose 44000 the first year and 11000 the next. Bynum ISD will lose 119,000 the first year and 31,000 the next. Caddo Mills will lose 601,000 the first year and 728,000 the next. And obviously, members, the list goes on and on and on. Their numbers on a chart that we've all been given. Not a single school district has been spared. Not a single school child, not a single family in the state of Texas will be spared cuts to public education. While it sent us into a second special session, it was ultimately unsuccessful. So lawmakers voted to cut $5.4 in public education spending. That included about $1.3 in discretionary grant money that schools received to fund full-day pre-K and after-school tutoring programs. The real problem is when everybody agrees, Democrats and Republicans that run for office and everybody agrees, that a bad policy is good. Do you, as the commissioner, believe Evan, we're putting enough money Evan, in? Evan, Evan, let's recognize, yeah. I'm the defendant in that case. Right. So I'm not going to give a deposition, no offense. But you can, offer a, but you can offer a commissioner a point of view as to whether well, enough money's going into public ed without let, getting into the terms no. of the case. The state of Texas has litigated its school finance system six times just since 1984. It's something that happens roughly once or twice a decade where um, school districts say, okay, we've reached the breaking point, we need to go to court over this. Your Honor, we represent 84 districts who collectively educate over 1.8 million students. We believe the system is unconstitutional. We believe it is inefficient, that it is inadequate, it is inequitable, it is arbitrary, it is unsuitable. All of those provisions that the Supreme Court has spoken to under Article 7, Section 1, and there's substantial evidence that the system has reached a point where continued improvement will not be possible absent significant change. Now, after the comma, Article 7, Section 1 goes on to say, but it shall be the duty of the legislature of the state to establish and make suitable provision for the support and maintenance of an efficient system of public free schools. Organizers say more than 11,000 people came out here. Parents, teachers, students, just concerned citizens from all over the state with one message for the legislature. Don't mess with Texas schools. Are you ready, Mia? We're good. Let's go. Let's do it. Do it. 
We're not activist type people, frankly. We're, we're just not. We're, we've never been joiners. I've never been moved to act. I mean, I had my own political beliefs, and you know, I followed things closely, and I was I was well aware, but I've never been moved to act on anything in my life. But I think once it became about my child, and once it became so in your face, we are giving up on public education, all bets were off. Okay, save your energy. It's gonna be a long march. People think that education is just going to be there and it's going to function the way it's supposed to function. And it's not true. There are people who are, who are trying to erode the system. And if you're not paying attention, they're going to be successful. Um, I, I think a lot of people just are, are in disbelief about that, that you know, people would attack public education. Yeah, they do. And they've been pretty successful at it. It's all happened so slowly. And I think that if it happened with a big bang, we're, we're, you know, we're not going to fund schools, you rip the Band-Aid off, then people would have noticed and said, oh my gosh, look at, look at what's happened to our schools. But they haven't done it that way. It's been slowly. They created an activist. The state of Texas made me who I am. We're going to protect our children and not neglect our children because we're going to invest in education. Yeah, there are moms who see the things I do when I took Jackson to the, the march in Austin. I had moms come up to me and say, that was wonderful. How did you know about that? They didn't know. That, that's the problem. The communication wasn't there. They weren't aware. They would have been there marching with me. Every child deserves equal educational opportunity. Every child should have a good public school with experienced teachers with small classes, with the arts, with history, with sciences, with foreign languages, with physical education every day, with librarians, with social workers, with guidance counselors and psychologists. We cannot close the achievement gap until we close the opportunity gap. So that's why I no longer trust them. They lost my trust. I do not trust them to do what's in the best interest of my child. I don't trust them to do what's in the best interest of the um, children in Texas. So now what they've created was, was a watchdog. My fight isn't over until I could walk to any neighbor's house and ask them, you know, is, is Texas funding its children appropriately? And they can tell me yes or no. Let's take another live look as lawmakers are gathering for the traditional ceremonial start. They'll have 140 days to tackle the big issues facing Texans, including how to pay for public schools after slashing nearly $5.5 billion from education funding back in 2011. The Senate will come to order and the Secretary will call a row. And while we know that public education has been the keystone in our state of educating our kids, are you familiar with the fact that we have never fully funded public education in the state of Texas? That would be my uh, conclusion. Would you Ms. would Thompson. you agree with me that we have not sufficiently funded public education in the state of Texas? I, I well, I agree. I agree with you. We haven't sufficiently funded, but there are occasions too, and I'm sure you'll agree with me that there are times when we have had what I call misfunding of education. I don't think anybody here wants to. Um, sacrifice education, but I do think there can be um, that we would make a mistake if we thought that throwing money after a broken system would remedy the problem. In the 2013 legislative session, we saw major education bills on testing and accountability, charter school policy, as well as possibly a, a voucher program that was called the Taxpayer Savings Grant. The battle in Austin over school choice. Many educators call them vouchers, but Houston State Senator Dan Patrick thinks the time has come. Look, we already have choice. If you're wealthy enough, you send your kids to private school. If you're mobile enough, you move to the suburbs. Why do people sit in traffic around the Dallas area? Because they want to get to a good school district. But if you're poor and you don't have mobility and you depend on public transportation and your son or daughter's in a failing school, you don't have any choice. Our next witness is Mark Terry. Yes, I'm Mark Terry. I'm a principal at Eubanks Intermediate School in South Lake, Texas. I've been in education for 33 years, 25 as a principal in inner city, rural, and suburban. I get the honor of being the first one to testify against Senate Bill 23. Uh, it's my opinion this bill subsidizes private schools and its students at the expense of public schools and our students. I believe it does remove money that could be available for public schools and our students. 
And as you heard earlier, uh, schools are not cheap. The lack of funding as it is now in the last few years has required me to reduce the number of teachers, the professional development I provide my teachers, programs uh, that help uh, my students improve. I feel the state also loses accountability for public dollars. Uh, the testing and accountability uh, that you heard from the private schools is not the same testing for accountability I use. They also do not use the same entry requirements. If I have a student show up at my door, I take them. I try my best to uh, make that student succeed. I suggest rather that you invest in public school education for all students. Thank you very much. Thank you. How are you? Good to see you. Good morning, how are you? I work with kids every day for 33 years. I've come in, I've been crossing guard, I've been a lunchroom monitor, I've been a custodian, uh, mowed the lawns, I've done all that. And to me, that makes a difference. What happened to you? I fractured my foot. How'd you do that? Um, Don't tell me PE. PE. Ah. Uh, hey, uh, would you? That is Most of my course. moral stance is out of the Republican Party. I'm just a very conservative person. I mean, I'm way over here <laughs> on the conservative side, and I get a lot of flack from that when I go to the Northeast because I'm way this conservative. But when it comes to schools, folks say, well, how can you be for public ed? I mean, you're a conservative or Republican. What do you mean you're supporting public ed? And my answer is the Republicans messed up by not concentrating on public schools. Where else are they going to be able to uh, give kids the grounding they need for our country if not in the public schools? You're not going to get it at all the little bitty privates and charters. That's where it's at. Question quick, members, Senator quick, Davis. Quick question. What's the consequence then to your school district as a consequence of that $5.4 billion budget cut in terms of your student-teacher ratios? Well, speaking from my school, I have a fifth and sixth grade school which has no cap on uh, what I can put in the classroom. My, cla my classes have gone from 24 to 26 to 1 to 29 to 32 to 1 uh, in the last few years. I've also had art classes that had 44 students, PE classes that had 120 students. Uh, it does make an, a difference uh, with the number of students that I have. We conducted a survey after the budget cuts to try to determine what the impact was. We had uh, over 3,500 teachers and school employees respond, uh, and what we found was a fairly devastating impact. I had ran into a colleague, and she said, this is the future of our profession. She has 38 kids in her math class. She has 35 in her science class. And I discussed with those teachers the challenges of working in a low-income middle school, trying to teach rigorous curriculum to way too many kids in a class to be able to be successful with everybody. I think if we looked at the statistics, uh, again, to my previous point, Ms. Venable, about the student-teacher ratio in the private and the parochial setting compared to the public setting has everything to do with the resources and the amount of money that's being spent per pupil to provide a student-teacher ratio that is producing extremely different results in terms of the quality of education the student's receiving. Thank you. If a complaint is class sizes are too big, this is a great way to fix that because what few would move, class sizes would go uh, down. But I would lose the ADA and I still have to pay that teacher. Pardon? I still have to pay that teacher. Well, you're no going to have to. Well, you know, you I lose the ADA, I use the ADA. I don't see in the bill where it protects my uh, water. Well, you will have, when your class size goes up from 23 in art up to 40-something, mm -hmm. um, if your sometimes things are um, better, better quality for the child if there's less kids in there, children in there, this would lower some of the class size. So unless you're getting another teacher, it lowers the class size. So if the complaint is too big a class size, one option is to allow parents have the choice and move them. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chair. And, and you would still keep your school property taxes? Yeah. Uh, but not my water. Right. You, st you, yeah. you still you still keep uh, those dollars flowing through. Um, I, I'll just pass because we're okay. Thank, the you Thank, you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next Thank panel, you. please. I see a, a great fit between being a conservative person wanting to talk about what made our great nation great and the public schools. Uh, and, and if they press me and say, well, look at the public schools, I'll ask them, who made the public school? You voted 
for the people who give us the laws that make the public school. I will suggest to you that, uh, uh, you know, th why do we have a Department of, of, of Education? Um, why? In March 1836, the Constitution of the Republic of Texas is adopted, and David Burnett elected its provisional president. I guess you have to start with the fact that uh, in the 1800s, the people of Texas adopted a constitution that requires that every child be given a satisfactory or a, a, a quality public education. One of the greatest pieces of the constitutional requirement, uh, I think, in, in Texas history, because it's one of the reasons that Texas has excelled over the years is that every child has, has the same, or close to the same uh, opportunities for public education. So much to be learned by so many in so little time. That is the problem. School buildings, equipment, teachers' loads, teachers' salaries, the training of teachers, and the tools for learning. January of 1989, I was sworn in. January the 10th, 1989. That very same week, or within two weeks, the first Supreme Court decision on Edgewood versus the state of Texas came down, saying that we had not complied with those constitutional provisions because we had not created an education system that was both equitable and adequate. Between 1989 and 1993, the legislature tried three more times to pass a funding system for public education that would comply with the Supreme Court's decisions and failed in two of those cases, the Supreme Court striking down two more tries. One of those tries had to have a constitutional amendment. We put it before the voters of the state and the voters of the state turned it down. Most lawmakers would admit that they need a gun to their head from the Texas Supreme Court to, to fix school finance because it is a highly political, thorny issue that, that nobody really wants to deal with. So in 1993, then Lieutenant Governor Bob Bullock told me I had to chair the Education Committee in the State Senate. I explained to him that I didn't know anything about education, that what I knew about was funding because I was an engineer and I understood the formulas. He said, well, that's where our problem is. It's in the funding formulas, therefore you have to do this. So I immediately became a student of the public education system in Texas and chaired the committee that year. In May of 1993, we finally passed a, a public education funding system that later on was declared constitutional by the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, the bases on which that bill was written have now gotten out of whack, and Judge Deitch just recently has decided that uh, over the years, the, the system has again become unconstitutional, both on equity and adequacy. So we're right kind of back where we were in 1989. The court declares the school finance system violates efficiency provisions of Article 7, Section 1 of the Texas Constitution in that it fails to provide substantially equal access to revenues necessary to provide for a general diffusion of knowledge. District Judge John Dietz's ruling lumped a number of cases into one. Essentially, his decision found the current system does not provide equal access to state revenue. He also found the finance system itself is not adequately funded. The kids that are wealthy and the kids that have opportunity will continue to flourish. But those that do not have access to the same types of opportunities of travel, exposure, linguistic skills, cultural development, all these different things that they can have to be able to have an opportunity to leave and develop in their own community, if that doesn't exist and all they're getting is the standardized version of knowledge today, it's severely compromising their ability to be strong, engaged citizens and that is going to destroy our democracy if we do not figure out how to engage and empower students with the easiest and most accessible thing that we have available and the thing that has made the United States the greatest country, which is the public education system.
we work really hard here to make this a place where kids can feel safe and feel wanted and feel loved and just feel secure. But it takes a lot of work on everybody's part. Better get to class. Come on, get your hoods off. Take your hood off. But that's why I'm here. And I'll be 80 in, in, uh, in April, and I just cannot envision an 80-year-old woman out in a high school, running a high school, especially in the roughest part of the city with the poorest kids in the city. That's it, there's the tardy bell. And you're just dragging along. Come on, move it. Move it, girls. Two of my favorites, <laughs> go fast, come on. So were you with her last night? Can you tell me the truth and whole truth or I'll help you God or I'll hurt you? Miss, um, you know I'm being honest with you. Know, we're no more victims. The last time I seen her was when I walked her to her bus. So you didn't know where she was last night? Did she text you or call you or anything? No. Well, here's what I want you to do because you're smart, you're intelligent. Don't keep the information from parents. That mother's been about to have a heart attack. Who did we get? Miss White, come in, please, Miss White. For her. Do you know anything about where she is? Oh, we already found out, like, everything we learned. Where is she? She is at her house now. Are you sure? Yes, because we got in contact with that number, and they told us that they already found her. Hello, uh, this is Bernie Simmons, principal at FUR. I was looking, I was going to see whether or not you had found Camelia. Did you find Camelia? So is she home now? Are you OK? When I came here, FUR was called a throwaway school. And some kids said to me, Miss, well, I wanted to tell you about FUR. And I said, well, what do you think of her? And he said, it sucks. He said, this school is for teachers. It's not for kids, because this is a throwaway school. And nobody cares whether we get an education or not. And uh, I heard that you might be able to turn this school around, that you might care about things. And I said, oh, well, I do care. But he said, well, how long are you going to be here? And I said, three months. And he said, my God, miss, Jesus Christ himself couldn't change this school in three months. And he said, next year, I'm going to be a senior, so would you please stay through next year? And I, and I looked at that kid, and I thought, this kid is begging to learn. Maybe I could make a difference. She won't talk to you? Is it possible for you to bring her in so we could talk with her? If you'll bring her in here, I want to talk with her and with you, OK? And I'll try to help you anyway. Don't get discouraged. We'll work it out, OK? OK, bye-bye. And this is my 53rd year in this district, so I should know a little bit about education. Girlfriend, why are you coming out? Girlfriend, where, why aren't you in class? What? Where's your pass? Where's your pass? Go in here. When my teacher gave me permission. Go in. Who, what teacher is it? Ms. Lamont. Ms. Lamont, I don't believe that. Go in there. I'll talk to Ms. Lamont. Okay. okay. Uh, where were you last night? And why did you do that? Because. Because why? I was tired of everything. You were tired of what? Tired of stuff. Tired of stuff? Talk to me about that. Because I want to tell you, I was here really early, around 6.15 this morning. Your mother was calling me. She was worried. Did that bother you? Here, wipe your eyes with that. What's going on? Nothing. There's something going on. You having trouble at home? Ask her if she gives her any trouble at home. Um, yeah, so after school she goes, I don't, we don't know where, and then she comes home late. Here's what I'm worried about. You're headed for trouble. How old are you? 14. Well, you know, we've got to do something. Because your mother's worried about you. My question to you is, how do we move forward <laughs> trapping a poor student in a poor performing school of which we have 532 in our state out of 8,500 campuses. We have 315,000 mostly minority students in failing schools whose mothers or guardians or grandmothers, in some cases parents, but many are in single family homes, who are desperate, desperate to have the education that you have. How do you say no to them? 
Senator Patrick, what I would say to them and what I have been saying to them and what I've been saying in this legislature is that we in the state of Texas are 49th in the country in what we are doing to support our per pupil investment in education in the state. And what I would say to them is that I would make them a priority. And I would make it a priority to put that money into our public schools so that they can perform. Okay, let's see how you're doing now. You're a buoy, intelligente. You're very smart. Has anybody ever told you how smart you are? Well, I want to tell you, because now I'm really not going to let you. Uh, when you were in uh, eighth grade, this is a Stanford test. This is a given all over the United States, OK? You, guess what? In reading, you scored on the 10th grade level, and you were in the eighth grade. So reading is your really strong suit. So we're gonna capitalize on the fact that you know how to read so you can work harder in science and social studies. Are you ready to be a scholar, a real good student? Yeah. You're ready for that? If we can give these kids hope that they really can achieve academically and be well phys uh, mentally and physically and emotionally, that they can be successful. And we see it happening. It's happening. 92% of our kids were accepted into college in the last year. What, what time does she go to work? No, it's 8.30. Okay. 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 8.30 in the morning? So she stayed home today because of this? Yeah. Okay. So you're missing work? Okay. You're going to work with me? I know you now. So you won't escape me. I come as a thief in the night. Okay? That's what I do. When I came here, it was, it was termed a, a, a dropout factory. We had 47% of our kids graduating from high school. And now we have 90% of them graduating. You always are going to have some for one reason or another who won't make it. But when we find those, we go out and try to drag them in. I have gone into a bedroom and dragged boys out of beds to get them to come back to school. My concern is that the students that leave the system First of all, there's nothing that will require the private or the parochial school to accept that student. And we have the issue of creaming that will probably occur. And unfortunately, it won't help every child. And there will be many children left behind in the public school system. And what we are talking about is draining resources. Granted, you put a hundred million, one hundred million dollar cap on your bill. Two five percent, roughly, of what but, we spend on. But we are talking about draining resources and leaving uh -huh. behind a huge number of students. And what I would say, and what I would ask you is, what do we say to that mother? What do we say to the mother whose child doesn't get into one of these private or parochial schools who are allowed? to discriminate in terms of who they take. One of my biggest criticisms of the school choice movement is, is that uh, it's, it's a lifeboat movement, you know, and um, if you can create this great lifeboat and it's wonderful and it, it, everything works well, you know, that's fine and good, but if the ship that everybody's on is sinking, that's really not an accomplishment. It's really not an accomplishment. I don't care how good that lifeboat is, if everybody's sinking and you're just saving a handful of kids, you know, we're better than that. I'm born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I moved because of Hurricane Katrina that happened in 2005. From there, we moved to Houston, Texas. My mom, she's a single mother. We had days where, like, she couldn't pay the light bill. We didn't have no food in the refrigerator. And it's just been, like, hard, hard times. I want to do something better with my life and not just focus on, like, where I'm coming from. That's what keeps me motivated. See, my mom struggle all her life to take care of me and my sisters, and I just keep that in my mind each and every day. And now the Pledge of Allegiance to the Texas State flag. Honor the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. You may be seated. Right here. Put in your citation just as a placeholder. I want you guys to get into the habit of knowing that whenever you have a quote, it must be cited. 
yeah. Yeah. Constantine, that's the black is... Acceleration, you can find it, sir. The formula for acceleration, see? You know the force. Okay, so first of all, it's a cosine. You're graphing it like it's a sine, right? Oh, that's why? So that, well, no, that, that plus, you gotta really look at the instructions. After school, I'm really like here from like, for three more hours or so, just playing football, doing something I love to do. And if I'm not doing that, I'll be, probably be at work because I have a job on, I work on Saturday and Sunday. One, two, three. Hey, give me blue offense, give me blue offense. Coach Gray, he's been a really big influence in my life because he's know he know my whole story and everything about me so he know where I'm coming from. Joseph is a is a kid that's determined to be successful. One of the things that they talked about was that that football and the other sports kept them involved and uh, they know without passing their classes they can't participate. So being part of a extracurricular activity helps motivate them to be successful in the classroom. So football is not the the number one priority for my kids. They do it because it's fun, but if it wasn't here, we're still gonna have a plan for it to be successful. And I'm gonna do my part, but everybody else is doing theirs too. We got to collaborate, make it together. 89% of the children of Houston are African American and Latino. The two groups overwhelmingly, the most likely to be living in poverty, 80% of those 240,000 kids qualify for reduced cost or free lunch programs. We know what poverty does to your ability to succeed in the public schools, and it is a safe statement to make that if Houston's African-American and Latino young people are unprepared to succeed in the knowledge economy of the 21st century, it is hard to envision a prosperous future for Houston. That is who we are and will be as the 21st century unfolds. I was brought here by my parents when I was 14. I had no say, say on the matter. I just had to come. I mean, one goes where one's parents are. One has to. My biggest challenges in school is my learning, learning wise in classes because they challenge me. They challenge me. And also because I think I get caught up with my friends and I talk a lot in the hallway and I think that's a big challenge for me because it keeps me off track. For me, school has taught me how to be social, how like to learn different learning like strategies and like what I do learn good with and what I don't. We have a challenging population, but we've always had challenging populations. You know, now it just happens to be kids who don't speak English as their first language. Uh, can you imagine all those kids that came off of farms and ranches across Texas in the 1920s, you know, in terms of difficult, tough populations to educate. When you look at the reality for Texas and for the country, here's what we have. We have two populations groups now, of one which is an aging literally off the end of the life chart set of non-Hispanic whites. Well, demographically, there's only two ways that populations grow through what we call natural increase, the excess of births over deaths, and as a result of migration. The average non-Hispanic white woman in the United States and in Texas is 42 years of age. The average Hispanic woman in the United States is 28 years of age. Well, there's a lot of childbearing years from 28 to 42, so that population is gonna grow from natural increase. Even the most recent period of very rapid growth from 2010 to 2012, 50% of the growth was due to natural increase, births. If you take migration, even the Census Bureau in its long-term projections projects that immigration involving Hispanics will amount to about 500,000 a year in this country. So we're likely to see growth in that population, both from natural increase and from immigration. The reality is then is that we have these two population groups. One is aging relatively rapidly, and so those two population groups will be increasingly interdependent on one another. And I say that the future of Texas and the future of the United States is, is tied to its minority populations. And how well they do is how well the United States and how well Texas will do. My parents are migrant workers, and my dad dropped out of middle school. 
and my mom didn't finish high school, but she got her GED. Ever since I can remember, my parents were always the ones encouraging me to get an education so that I wouldn't end up having to move around with my family and I could have a stable life and a stable career. When I was little, my mom couldn't help me with my work. My dad does know English and my mom knew like a little, knows a little bit. My dad knows more, but they couldn't really help me much on my homework or stuff like that. I have memories from when I was around three years old and we would live here. And Cassie was a baby. And there's like a lot of pictures that we have where I'm like the little toddler and she's a little baby girl. And it's in one of these trailer homes. Because I think they, they follow us when we work in the field and they see the bad life that we were taking over there, having, having a hard time for everything. I think that there's a lot of low expectations for, for migrant students. I think that people believe, oh, they're just gonna continue with their family started or they're gonna go back. Like, that's how you were destined to work as or do, but... Los sueños yo tengo para mis hijos, que salgan adelante y que no anden como vamos a andar nosotros de aquí para allá y de allá para acá buscando la vida, trabaje y trabaje. Que sean alguien grande en la vida. Pero, ¿a qué horas es? Ya en la tarde. Education will be the cotton and the oil of the Texas economy in the 21st century. There are still blue collar jobs, but they require technical skills. The minimum education for anyone in America from now on until the end of the world to be able to get a decent job is at least 14 years of education, at least two years beyond high school into the community college system. Our kids are competing not just with Galveston kids or San Antonio kids, they are competing with Taiwanese kids and German kids and Indian kids for the good jobs of the 21st century in a global labor pool where companies can produce goods anywhere, can work from any place. That's the great challenge. Well, I believe it's going to be very hard because of what I want. I have, I have a very long want list, so I believe it's going to be very challenging for me to achieve what I want. It's not going to be easy at all. The cuts that occurred cut out those programs like pre-K, and they were cutting the very heart of trying to deal with the population that we had. There you go. One of the reasons why pre-kindergarten exists is to give children a leg up so that all children enter kindergarten or enter our school system on a level playing field. Mama called the doctor and the doctor said... No more money. No more monkeys. I think people would be surprised by my work as an economist that shows high rates of return uh, in the neighborhood of $10 for every dollar invested in a high quality preschool program. A good preschool program uh, does two things for child development. It enhances their social and emotional development and it enhances their cognitive development. Both of those things lead them to do better in school make it easier for them to acquire skills, make it much more likely they're going to persist and get advanced education in math and science, that they'll be literate, that they'll be problem solvers, and that they know how to get along with other people and work in teams. These are all things that employers want, and that's the workforce of the future. My dad, always always says this it's a quote he always says if you don't learn from history you're doomed to repeat it so i always want to learn like i don't want to make the same mistakes and or and then um also as a nation america like the mis the the things we did in the past and most people they're not like knowledgeable about what we did we bear the cost of failing to invest in good education in the early years every day the high costs of prisons and the criminal justice system, the high costs of social services and welfare, the high costs of special education and remediation, the high costs of unemployment because people can't get a decent job 
at a good wage because they don't have the skill set. We need um, an educated and, and informed citizenry. And I don't know who in Texas of any age wants to live in a state that is governed by the uneducated. So this duty as it presents itself to me is not need, is not desire, but a pure duty to govern in a manner that the impoverished child is no longer the fastest growing demography in the state. Because if it is, we may well become that place that none of us choose to call home. It's a village kind of deal. It's not just the school. It's the community. It's the parents. It's the business support. It's where it's located. It's all kinds of stuff. And you just can't say, well, that's a low-performing school. They're doing a lousy job. Maybe some of them are. But more likely, you'll go in there. And that's, the, that's a safety net for the kids. What the kids tell me is that when I leave, there's going to be gang warfare. And it's because I work with the gangs. I, I've, I've been getting graffiti in the bathrooms, the ninth graders, incoming ninth graders. We have 16 identified gangs on this campus. So I've been working with the ones. I go in the restrooms and I see all the graffiti. So I call them in. Five of these guys down the hall. We'll kind of swap them out so everyone gets a chance to be involved in it. OK. So are you going to start up the second floor or are you going to start over? Over there. So you're, but there's only one restroom over there. We'll get everybody over, get five, get started, and we'll move and separate. Okay. I don't want to have too many guys and then not enough okay. guys. But then you're going to move them to the next location. Yes, ma'am. OK. If when you get in there and you see all of that graffiti, it's going to be, it's going to have different gang things up there. So all of you are going to now be sure that this doesn't happen again. You chose the color of the paint. You've, chose, you've chosen all of this. So you're going to work with us to be sure that nobody She's goes in there and writes that stuff in there again, OK? If with no more Denver Harbor, no more FedEx, no more. You hear what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. I mean it, because otherwise I'm, I'm going to really work you over. Because after all, in me painting, you better <laughs> not do it again, OK? OK, let's move on. Right, my leaders, over. Lepe, Ivana, and they went with Dr. Simmons. And they are all working together to paint the bathrooms. And I think that the kids won't be as likely to go in and write graffiti on there again if they're having to paint it with me. And so they're all eager to work. I'm not so eager to paint those restrooms, but they're all eager to, to go up and paint the restrooms. Painting is the one thing that releases your mind to rest, to rest. Painting is not stressful. But that's the way I work with them is to give them community service. And then I work with them. I'm not too good to do whatever I'm asking them to do as well. Hey guys, you see how much trouble it is to undo what you all did with all that, just a little gra gang graffiti? This is crazy. I'm not sure how accomplished I am at painting restrooms, but we'll find out, <laughs> so we'll see. So all you guys, come on, we're gonna go back over to the main building. Forevermore? <laughs> come on. In my opinion, all money that is in the Texas budget should go to education. All money that is available for public education should go there. And if you recall, Senator, in the last legislative session, when we were having the debate on the cut, the $5.4 billion cut to public ed, we did propose that funds like the governor's enterprise and emerging technology fund be used for purposes rather than going to that direction to help forestall the enormous cut that was made. And unless and until we get back to where we were in that funding shortfall, and unless and until we satisfy the court's decision with regard to us not um, abiding by our constitutional duty to fund public schools, I would say that yes, every extra dollar is a dollar that should go to our public So, So if we have extra dollars, we should not consider putting it to water or to roads or to Medicaid or to helping poor students? Is that is that what you're suggesting, in, in my, that every dollar in the budget? That's not what I just said, Senator. That's not what I just said. Is it going to be a great day? Do you have P.E. or music today? Both. Both? We always do P.E. Yeah. and then art or music. Oh, is today art or music? When we received Jackson's school supply list, I was amazed by the things that they were having to ask for. We had to supply the entire art department. You know, every, everybody had to bring in 10 packs of crayons. Now, I mean, this is all okay, but these are things that used to be funded. 
as a taxpayer, I am not happy the taxes that I pay putting in to the, some of the, the taxpayers, the tax dollars I send in go to also some failing schools. So I am a taxpayer that represents disappointment where my taxpayers are, my tax dollars are being utilized or how they're being utilized. I support good education first and foremost, an education for the child. What I don't support are failing schools. Give me hugs and kisses. I love you. If you don't say to somebody that's unacceptable, and if you don't say it to the right people, it'll continue and it will actually get worse. Yep. Okay. Mr. Caprigliani, yes. my name is Kimberly Burkett. Sure. I'm from North Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. This is my son Jackson. He attends Northwest ISD as a kindergartner. He ran a fun run today. You can see his shirt. He ran 40 laps as five-year-old, not for a trip to Austin or D.C. or Disney World, for curriculum. Sure. He ran for curriculum. So when you support a budget that does not restore his funding, how can you say you support public education? I know that you do at the local level, but your roving isn't consistent with that. Sure. Can you please explain your vote? I will. And, and what I'll say, I saw a chart by, uh, by a consulting firm that went through and looked at it. And if you look at whether you say it's three and a half billion or five billion or six billion, not all the dollars are going to be given to every school district in exactly the same rate. And so what that means is that <clears throat> I, when I looked at the chart, I think Grapevine Colleyville is going to get about 3% of their cuts back. Uh, there are some school districts that are going to get 160% of their cuts back. So, uh, you know, I'll be honest, I mean, if, if we threw in another billion, I have to ask, okay, how does my district, uh, why would we contribute one more billion dollars if it's not going to be appropriated uh, evenly throughout the rest of school districts? And that's where a lot of us are going to have some heartburn and in, in increasing it. Any other oh, okay. okay, thank you. What was probably most frustrating was how so many people in the room stood up and applauded as if it wasn't a big deal, as if you know his answer was acceptable, and the fact that we're no longer going to fund Texas public schools, and everyone stands up and applauds like, okay, that's a good thing, great, wonderful, and they thank you. These are people that live where I live, and more than likely live in the same school district that my son attends. One of the big things that draws people to a community is the school. If there's no public school, what's going to happen to your property value? I mean, there's no way to predict that for sure, but if Granger were to close tomorrow, our property values would plummet. That we wouldn't be able to sell our homes, our property, I mean, just wouldn't be worth anything. So then what's the value of moving into that community if there's no community school? Waco is a good example. At one time, it was this shining star in Central Texas. It was well-funded and well-respected, and it was a, a very desirable school district. But in Waco, where we both live, they, they had to close nine campuses after the budget cuts of 2011. And by and large, people thought that was a local problem. They didn't understand that it was because of the budget cuts that the legislature imposed upon us. You can have a cascade effect if people in your community start believing that your schools are bad. It further erodes support for education at a time when you need it most. Over time, a change happens and um, people start leaving. It never stays the same. A community is either getting better or it's decreasing in its quality of life. So we have got to decide what we're going to do. What we're trying to do is mobilize ministers and church leaders to support our teachers and public schools and public school educators. Come on, Mitch. We're glad you're here, man. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Good to see you. I'm well. We're mobilizing pastors and church leaders for a pro-public education advocacy group. It is good, Charles. Don't need to tell all of, all of you that our schools are becoming comprehensive social service providers for our poor kids. And at the same time that unfortunately, the funding for those schools is decreasing. So we basically wanna do two things. We wanna facilitate this partnership 
between the local school and the local church, between the local pastor and the local principal and the superintendent, and then we want to leverage that grassroots support. That's the first thing. And then that pastor and that faith community learns the needs of that school and can be good advocates to our policymakers about funding public education. It's a simple concept. That's it in a nutshell. A public trust is all the citizens of our state combining their resources through tax dollars to secure an adequate education for all our children. That is, not just my children, but also my neighbor's children. Now my children are grown. I don't have school-age children. Okay, do I say, well, I don't have any more responsibility. My tax money shouldn't go toward supporting education. My kids are, I've already paid for my kids. No, I have a responsibility to educate your children and my neighbor's children, and especially my, ch my neighbors who live across the tracks, on the other side of the tracks. I have a responsibility in a democracy to educate those children. We want everyone being properly educated. Thank you, my name is Charles Johnson. I'm a pastor in Fort Worth, Texas. I represent the Christian Life Commission of the Baptist General Convention of Texas, 5,500 Baptist churches in this great state. And I'm testifying on behalf of the Coalition for Public Schools against this bill. And I'm going to pick up where Governor Ratliff left off. Words have meanings. We all deal with words. Preachers deal with words. And the Coalition doesn't care whether you call this a voucher or a tuition tax credit. The Christian Life Commission sees this as a voucher. It is a reduction in the public revenues. It is money that would not otherwise be given. It is a diversion of those public funds to private schools. But my chief objection to this bill, Senator Patrick, is church-state separation. Any time public entities, public dollars support religious education, a violation of the First Amendment is going to follow. Religion is completely voluntary. As a Baptist, I believe that. It must always be voluntary. And this state has no right to establish or advance any religious cause. It is not the proper authority of this state or any state. As a, as a Baptist, and I'm covered today. My wife's Catholic. Our kids are Baptist and very confused. Um, I, I don't know that all Baptists would share your point of view. We do have, sadly, we do have failing schools, and we, we, we do have courageous teachers that are trying their best. But we do have students that can't read at grade level, as you've heard before. And we do have a 20% of dropouts. So we do have failing schools. And uh, so I appreciate your testimony. Um, but as you heard earlier from our, the lawyer who testified, the courts have been clear on this. Money not sent to the government because of a tax credit is not considered public money. So therefore, it's not viewed as a it, it doesn't violate the separation of churches. How is this not a tax loophole? You know, I give money to my Baptist church. I don't consider that a tax loophole. I consider that an opportunity to support God. Any other questions? I, uh, I, didn't, think you, I didn't think you'd respond. I don't think God would consider it a loophole. <laughs> I think God would consider it tithing, which we're required to do. Right. Well, I'm not trying to speak on behalf of God, just the Baptist. <laughs> But of those 8,500 campuses, K through 12 across Texas, about 500 are failures. Imagine sending your child to a school that we say is a failure. We know our public schools have problems. We hear about those problems. And a politician will, who wants to privatize public education will seize on that and will use that anecdote and will repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it to the point where the impression is given that that's the case in all of our schools. Wrong. I really question, you know, whenever somebody talks to me about failing schools, I always say, well, well, tell me about that. Can you define that? What does that look like? And frankly, most people will, they, they come back with propaganda that they've heard. When a school is failing in Texas, if your school has failed for five years in a row, imagine a school that's failing year after year. 
I know we had uh, some schools in, in Houston that were about to be taken over by the state because they had failed. And what they had actually done was failed a state test. And there are so many other things that some of them were doing well with, but they called them, fa they were identified as failing schools. Where there are problems in the public education system, fix them, fix them. And the problem is the political will to do what it takes to fix those schools doesn't exist because those schools are in areas where we can't bring ourselves to invest the way we need to. What I want us to keep doing is tying all of our learning together because we've spent a lot of time talking about what the 21st century learner should be learning. Since I've been here, one time we were low performing. And of course I got the call that I was gonna be removed. What they usually did was send a police officer and escort you off campus. Uh, and that's the way you were removed from the school. So I said, when you, s you come out to remove me, I'm going to have Channel 13 here and Channel 2, and they're going to be filming why you're removing an old woman that you called out of retirement to come here, and suddenly you're going to have a police officer escort her off the campus, and it'll be all over the media. So I can't wait until you come to remove me. And that night I got a call saying, we've decided to leave you in the school. What they do is take a, an assessment tool that is used to rank schools or to, to rate schools and when there is, uh, when that assessment is failed, a school doesn't reach to a standard in a certain area, that school will be determined a failing school. I don't use that term. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's a just way to describe that local school. Part of what played into that is the school accountability ratings that did not take into account student growth. They just looked at what percentage of kids were passing a test, which is an absolutely terrible indicator of how well a school is doing. Because you could have come, kids come into a school and nobody's ready to pass the state test, and you could take a substantial number of those kids and really push their, their achievement to pretty high levels and still be unacceptable on the school accountability rating because it doesn't look at growth. It only looks at where you are relative to what the passing rate is. We have young people, for example, that come in and they may be 15 or 16 years old and they're just immigrated from Mexico, for example. And within one year of their arrival, they're expected to pass a standardized test at their grade level. Um, so in high school, they may be expected to, to, to pass an English one or English two standardized exam in, in English, where you know research tells us it takes several years for language to develop to the point where you can be really fluent. I can't imagine any of us that would think that um, that we could all go to Germany or somewhere else and within one year um, pass exams in, you know, biology and algebra and history and so forth, all completely in on-level German. Yes, the 23. Mai. Ich habe auch in mein Geburtstag. Tag? Der 6. Mai. Oh, das yeah. Das ist der beste Tag in Mai. Yeah. You've got the hardest schools, and you're not giving them stat development. You're not given the principal leadership development. You're, in fact, cutting back because you're not meeting the grades, so they're going to take a little bit away from you. That, that's, that makes no sense to me. At the time that you're really requiring tougher, higher standards, which is a good thing, doing that costs money. Texas has been a leader in the nation in high stakes test driven accountability. It is a place where the Bush administration really developed the No Child Left Behind Act, which rolled out all of the high stakes rigorous testing across the nation. I think the initial intention was, was good. It was very good. Um, and I think we've actually learned a lot from it. Um, those students who used to just be shoved to the side and said, you don't need to learn, you're not college material, which were the majority, were poverty, minority, special ed children, um, 
you know, the light has been shined on that. And, and so that's the good news about this is that it did what it was intended to do. And then like a lot of good things, it went way too far. It's almost like you have to stop teaching what you normally teach and you have to alter it so that you're teaching STAR. And Ms. Hunt here, she teaches our preamble to the Constitution. She teaches uh, the Revolutionary War uh, about founding fathers. But because of STAR coming up, well, we're gonna have to alter it a little bit so we can look at STAR and not about what's really important to our kids. And that's one of the impacts I see with the testing. It really is frustrating. When you focus intently on preparing students for the test, you can no longer say, hey, these kids are well prepared. They know the curriculum well. Um, because all you can say is they know the test items well, but that's not all, that's not what's in the curriculum. The test items are a very small subset of what's in the curriculum. And when you just focus on what's gonna be on the test, the test score no longer tells you what the kids know about the entire curriculum. The fact that you're all sitting down taking the exact same test, the exact same questions, the exact same way, some of you are going to struggle a little bit more because that's not how you test. That's not what your strong, you know, suits are in, in science. You like to draw it. You like to act it out. I like learning about math because that was my favorite subject in school. Why? Math. Because you always have to use your fingers. You have to think a lot. Like, I'm a thinker. You have to think a lot and everything. You have to find the problem. Like, you have to use your hands, thinking, your brain. So, the flip side of what we've just discussed, you've passed your grade. You've aced your final. You've gotten all your credits. But the score results come back, and you fail star. Should you have to go to summer school? The tests are important. I, I, I do believe that. However, I don't think that they should dictate what type of student I have, what type of teacher I am. Um, I think sometimes we put so much emphasis on these tests that students believe that's the only reason they come to school is to take the test. What you learn through the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And when at the end of the year, we take a starter and that's all we learn from the beginning to the end. So it's like passing the class as you pass the starter. Finals is just for your grades, for your classes. Stars for your, like, if you pass or not. They're trying to compare us to, like, bigger and better schools than us. And I want to see what we, like, what's the difference between us. And that's a problem. I think education is so much more than a test. And you, there's so many things that you can learn outside of A, B, C, D. And I think we need to get back to that, which is why I got into teaching. Excuse me. Now, everybody is drawing a sketch of this beautiful mountain range. Having accountability makes you think about how can I teach this effectively? And how can I design adroit lessons that, you know, target what has to be taught? So I'm okay, I'm okay with having, you know, some, with having standards. I think that's good. I think it's made our school better in many cases. So El Nino class is a warming event. Last year I was in this testing regimen, the last two years with the STAR test. Now, my kids didn't do very well on this district-wide test that came out. They don't say, well, here's the actual criteria. Apparently, the kids didn't grow very much. Like, I, I think I dumbed them down. They were less than. And I'm on the district website for being an exemplary teacher in higher-order thinking skills, no less. But my test scores were so low that apparently I was supposed to be put on a growth plan. They said, well, he should be fired because my scores are very low. And three other teachers here that are pretty, you know, they're pretty good teachers. So having just one criteria there, is not a fair assessment. I was thinking, I hope I do. I hope I passed it. I was even doing this. High stakes testing is not preparing our students for life after high school. Relevant foundational experience does. These tests make kids cry because they either think they're not going to be able to pass the test, or they have so much pressure on them that it makes them throw up. Overall, I will miss at least 40 days of classroom instruction to test. Some kids stay after school to take the test or miss recess and lunch to complete the STAR test. I don't mind a test, but they spend millions of dollars on the test, and the test lasts for hours, sometimes even longer. And they say that if you don't take the test, then you can't go on to the next grade level, and I think that's just dumb. Thank you for taking your time to hear my speech, and I hope someday somebody will make a change and they'll no longer be the STAR test to benchmark. There's been a backlash to testing here and it's something that critics are saying we it's not testing that's the problem it is the 
high stakes that we attach to the testing. It's that we're making teachers evaluations based on how their students perform on a test. It is that we are making the future of whether a school stays open based on how their students do on a test. We've created a culture of testing rather than a culture of learning, and it's the importance that we're putting on those tests that should really be just to measure how a student is doing in a particular course. My daughter told me that Tamsa reminded her of something she learned in biology many years ago. She says, um, Mom, do you know what the most dangerous animal in the world is? This is what we learned in biology. I said, okay, you know, you start thinking a lion, a bear, a killer whale, or, you know, a dangerous snake or something like that. And she said, no, it's the mother of any species that perceives that its child is in danger. And so that's why we're formidable because, you know, we feel like the state is messing with our kids. As a Houston parent that I know that not a whole lot of us come in here unless we're yelling and screaming that we don't like what's been done to, to proactively say, you know, please create effective policy for the that's in the best interest of the children, not in the best interest of somebody else. Well, we are um, listening intently. Thank you. A group of parents that formed several months before the legislative session and um, a former education commissioner dubbed them the Moms Against Drunk Testing. It was something that they were that passionate about and that they were that concerned about their, the effects of it on, on students. As parents, we are now really rallying to speak with legislators. Unfortunately, we don't even think the TEA has the power anymore. This has become a legislative nightmare. And honestly, the legislators we've talked to, and we've talked to almost every one of them, they even say, what have we done? How have we gotten here? My name is Sue Digard. I am a parent in the Houston Independent School District, and I am testifying on this bill today. The goal is not measuring our children, that is a measure of the progress. Our goal is not whether or not they graduate from high school or go to college. Our end game is whether or not these children, when they are adults, are productive members of society that contribute to our economy. I believe that, that everyone, regardless of what your position is on testing, um, wants to do what's best by children. I think we want children to have a good education. We want children to excel. And so I think that's where the commonality is. I think we differ on how to do that. Um, they tend to believe that a whole lot of testing is going to drive better teaching. Uh, I believe just the opposite. I believe that a whole lot of testing drives more superficial teaching with a few facts, but not really the depth and the creative thinking and the analytical thinking that you really need. Given the fact that uh, only about 25% of our students today are graduating career or college ready based on other assessments by the ACT, or if you look at the tax uh, commended, passing both math and reading at the commended level, that's about 25%. Uh, we believe about 65% of ninth graders graduate in four years. Obviously, there's a lot of debate about what exactly that number is, but that means that only 16% of our ninth graders are graduating in four years career or college ready. I, I just have a problem with the, the logic that I hear you okay. laying out. And, and that is that uh, high stakes testing leads to college readiness or career readiness. Yes. And then you point to today's figures of college readiness, 25% or if you take out the you only count the, if you, if you just look at the students who started high school, that's 19%. But that's under today's status quo. That's with high stakes testing. That's with the current regime of standardized testing. And then the stuff that we really care about, like creative minds, kids who have a can-do spirit, problem solvers, now, that stuff isn't tested. Grit. Persistence? That's not tested. So while the idea of we measure what we treasure rhymes, <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> and this logic that high stakes testing is going to save us. Well, we have high stakes testing today. And it is the cause of this 19% aren't ready for college or career.
something that is often discussed not in polite company, right. but you hear a lot of it, that somehow the private testing companies have rigged this. Do you believe there's any validity to the idea that the private I mean, testing do, companies are responsible Do I believe that testing companies, ACT, SAT, Pearson, and everybody in between are, are enthusiastic about selling tests to states? Hell yeah, of course they are. But, but I don't think that's the boogeyman You don't here. put this on them. No, I do not. You know, we have asked them, and they're obviously a very credible player in the industry, you know, to develop tests as we've stipulated. And they, and they have done that. I mean, I just, I don't think that's the issue that we ought to be discussing. So, you know, Pearson makes the tests and makes tons of money. But then they also make all these wonderful programs that teach you how to pass the test. And all the schools can purchase these remediation courses. And then there's people that are offering uh, tutoring for end of course exams and how to pass, you know, the latest and greatest tests that's gonna, you know, transform public education. All these folks are making money off of this. Some may say that, and I don't know how I can dispute it other than to say that I have a 30-year history of uh, uh, belief in the value of public education and worked as a, what I consider a critical friend to see that it's improved over the years. And I think I have a pretty good track record. I'm, I'm not questioning your, okay. your intention, uh, but the stakes are high. Yes, sir. Their contract is near half a billion dollars over a four-year period. And, you know, frankly, when the stakes are that high, we often don't make decisions that are in the best interests of children. I think that the, uh, the relationship between the state of Texas and the testing company is that of a, a vendor. And that there was a RFP put out that laid out what they wanted them to do and how they wanted them to do it. And if they are not following that uh, contract, then they should be brought to, brought uh, to uh, make the changes. If there are changes needed in the contract, then uh, that would be appropriate, in your opinion or the others, whatever, of the agency or the <laughs> members of the legislature. In other words, if they're not doing what the agency wants them to do, tell them to do it differently. I think the customer in this case, in this case is the TEA because that's the contract, who they have a contract with. So if they're not doing what TEA wants them to do, then uh, they need to change the contract. Like You've been around here long enough and you know that there are former folks at TEA that are now with Pearson. Right. I guess, I guess there are. I don't really know offhand. But yeah, I understand. I but that. at the same time, I think that it's a contractual relationship. And if they're not performing satisfactorily or if there are modifications that should be made, then let's make them. The next state closest to us in student population is New York. And they spend about $40 million over a four-year period. Right. We're way out there and right. anomaly in this area. It seems to me that we've lost our minds. And I know we've lost our souls. Our souls went a long time ago. And when we start valuing money and uh, test scores or whatever those things are there other than human beings, edu public education, that's why well, we're in trouble. And it's because we, we're valuing the wrong things, in my opinion. The privateers who have been pushing forward this effort to dramatically change our public education system have used a number of techniques to try to get money out of the public schools. Uh, some of those techniques include charter schools that operate within the public school system but are a sort of camel's nose under the tent way to expand to get that money out of the system in its entirety. Let's be candid about this. There are billions and billions of dollars that are required to educate our children and corporations, private corporations and private business concerns want a piece of that pie. You've invested in retail centers, ski parks, you've got charter schools, you've got movie theaters. What would be, the, if you could buy one thing right now, David, one type of asset in real estate, what would it be? Well, we probably the charter school business, we said is our highest growth and most appealing segment right now of the portfolio. It's the most high in demand, it's the most recession resistant and great opportunity set with 500 schools starting every year. There's a lot of talk nationally about sort of what's known as a portfolio approach to running schools. 
um, where sort of districts might contract with kind of an array of charter schools or nonprofits. Um, and there's this idea that sort of the weakest schools will kind of be shed like underperforming stocks in a portfolio and um, maybe recombined with the higher performing ones, which is the equivalent of sort of new and stronger charter operators coming in and taking over the weaker schools. I understand that three of your nine imagined schools are scheduled to actually lose their charters for the next school year. Does this pose a risk to, uh, to investors? We've structured our affairs so this is not going to impact our rent roll and in fact we see this as a maybe even a good experience as the industry thins out some of the less performing schools and we move on to the best performing schools. Dave, members, and this is a, a long amendment, but it contains a number of changes that we've worked out with stakeholders to ensure we have the strongest language possible in, in ensuring high quality charters. And I want there to be no no doubt in anyone's mind that the purpose of, of expansion of charters as we move forward is that we have the best and the highest quality charters possible and that we close down our poor performing charters that deserve to be closed down. So what I'm recommending is that for every uh, charter we close, we have the option to open five. The basic concept of charter schools that sets them apart from traditional school districts is greater um, flexibility in exchange for higher accountability. So charter schools are exempt from quite a bit of state statute and, and virtually all um, local policy and local regulation. The theory behind school choice is that competition will raise all ships, that, that the public schools will do better because they're competing with these innovative charter schools. But the reality is something way more nefarious than that. The reality is uh, I'm going to start my own school. I could start a charter school if I wanted to, right? I, I've, got, I've got land I could build a school on and start a charter school. Um, I could get new market tax credits. I could do the whole deal. And I could go to these surrounding communities and say, hey, send me your kids. I'll take them. I could do a lottery and say, hey, it's fair. Anybody can enter the lottery. But I know that the people who register for the lottery are going to be a self-selected group of people. They're going to value education because they're looking for a school for their kid. I know that, first of all. Um, the second thing I can do is I can, I can fill my school up with these randomly selected lottery kids, and then the kids who don't perform, I can find a pretext to, ex to expel those kids. I can do that. And then I can fill those slots with other kids who will get the test scores I need them to get. And then I can you know, run around and beat the drum about how great my test sc scores are and say, look how good my school is. I'm outperforming these other schools. That's one of the things about the charter school movement. If it was the original vision of supportive research, research and development, innovative laboratories of education, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But what it has become is, is, a, is, is a competition between schools that have advantages versus the general public education system. And I look at it from that system standpoint. You know, can a can a completely charterized school system work? And and the question that always comes up in my mind is, where do the kids who none of those schools will take end up? And the answer is always, well, they end up in the public system. I would see my kiddos leave us and go to a charter and very often, six months or a year later, come back from the charter. Um, I did not see any evidence that we had any charter schools serving our children who were helping them uh, add value to their academics. I think the, the biggest myth people have about schools of all types is how similar they are. <laughs> I mean, yes, there are sort of different rules and laws surrounding traditional and charter schools, but spending time in both, they're all sort of grappling with the same issues and challenges. And the whole idea about charter schools is that they would be much more innovative and experimental, but um, I, don't, I don't really think that's proven to be the case. People would make you know, grandiose claims about charter schools are outperforming public schools and we're sending all the kids to college. And so I wanted to see if that was true and I didn't really know if it was or not. And so I always go and look at the data and, and then make a conclusion based on the data. I reviewed those studies and those studies found that charter schools don't perform any better than public schools. And in fact, the majority of charter schools in Texas underperform public schools 
it turns out that a lot of kids from the charter schools never make it to the 12th grade. They never graduate. So they're claiming, hey, all of our students go to college. No, all, you know, the 50% that made it to 12th grade and graduated went to college. But that's a completely different story than what they imply to the public. Like, hey, enroll in our charter school and your kid's going to go to college because all our kids go to college. That turns out not to be true. And the public just doesn't understand that because the state doesn't really make that data available in a way that the public can consume it. So I drove by a charter, brand new charter, beautiful building. And there's a big sign on the building that said, uh, open enrollment, free tuition, nurturing environment, science for all. So I came back, uh, I got my PR folks together and I said, we need to order 38 big signs that say, open enrollment, free tuition, nurturing environment, science for all. So that's where it started, the great realization that we needed to market what we have. Despite all you're talking about charters, their niche isn't to take on all of all of the students. Uh, they have a niche, and, and that's fine, and, and, and we realize that, but every child who comes to our door will get educated, and that's still a point of pride for public education. Our school does feel like a community because each classroom is like a house, and each, each classroom is like a family, and like the next door classroom is like the next, next door neighbor. So you feel like you can just go next door and like socialize with the other kids or whatever. We all need to be educated more. We need to spend more time pondering uh, all of that and what would make this, this uh, education system better. Not just creating charter schools and not just sending kids to private schools and not creating the haves and the have nots, but giving, letting everybody have what they need. What does it mean to be educated in a 21st century environment, and what does that mean for my child leaving us? Because it used to mean, when, you know, everybody goes back to when I was in school, it meant this. Well, when I was in school, it meant this, is not is, is far, far from what it means now. And I don't want people to be nostalgic. I want them to say, wow, this has changed so much, I don't even recognize it. It's really more of a rhetorical notion than anything realistic, that, that schools haven't changed. It's like looking at a car and saying, you know, cars in the 1800s have four wheels and they still do, so cars haven't innovated. Well, of course they have, you know, with GPS and air conditioning and all this other stuff. Schools are the same way. Innovation here may look different than innovation somewhere else. In this community, the jobs that are available for students, a lot of those are in the oil and gas industry or in ranching and farming. So our school needs to have programs that are associated with those skill sets. So our mission as a school district here is we're committed to designing a system that will prepare every student, that will connect them, and that will go a long ways towards ensuring some kind of college completion. Now, that can be the four-year college for those students who that's where their interest is. It can be an associate's degree. It can be certifications through the community college. Oh, listen, we won a debate this weekend. Uh, we competed with every school in, in HISD. We offered uh, Spanish, uh, Chinese, and Russian. We beat Carnegie, which is a vanguard program of gifted kids. We beat uh, us, we beat uh, Lamar. This is our uh, Russian class. We've won, taken state in Russian for 11 years straight. We beat all of these, where there are all these kids who have money, and they, what the district does is, because of schools of choice, they set up magnet programs where the gifted kids all go to one school. Well, we beat them, and I love it. Giving them the ownership of their lessons and of their questioning and of their thinking, they own their learning, they, they take ownership in their learning, and so they're taking it beyond the classroom now. It's not just regurgitating facts. Dad, did you find anything yet? How about the Mexico? Yeah, that's right here. 1846?
Do you know this, that song? I won't dance, don't ask me. You never heard that song? Oh, yeah. I heard the high school musical one. I don't dance, I'm going to Really? Yeah. I'd wanted to be a dancer. And I saw myself on Broadway. Okay. And so <laughs> I, I started to college, and I was in a class with all the mirrors around the walls and all this. And we were all dancing and throwing our legs up. And I saw those legs going up almost to the ceiling, I thought. And mine would be about this high going up. So I called my mother and I said, why didn't somebody tell me I can't be a dancer? And she said, you can be anything you want to be. You hear me? I don't want you to do nothing but dominate. Um, I got this award for top scholar in Houston, Texas, because I'm one of the top 25 scholars for academic and playing football, top football player in Houston, Texas. Once I graduate, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go to college to be a nurse, and I'm going to see where it takes me from there. Now, I know that you have reason to be proud that we have made some efforts towards restoration, but could you please explain to me how we finally get to back to where we were in 2011, considering how much money is available to do that if we wanted to do it? Lon, we have not restored dollar for dollar, but as, uh, as an article that was uh, in the Quorum Report uh, by Lynn Moak. He said that most school districts will get back to the 2010-2011 school year funding levels under the restoration of funds as Senate Bill 1, the committee substitute, is providing. Well, you know, since we're talking about public education, you know, many of us feel like the bill that we passed last session deserved an F. Representative Guerin raises a point of order. The gentleman's time has expired. The point of order is well taken and sustained. Thank you for the opportunity to clarify that we are not restoring what we took from the children in the way of $5 billion last year. Clerk, ring the bell. At the end of the 2013 legislative session, the budget did not include increased funding, but they did restore 3.4 of the 5.4 billion that was cut in 2011. Well, you know, in a perfect world, legislatures would be focused on what's really best for kids. I don't believe that's happening. Um, well, this is my uh, last, last day of uh, public school employment. After a lot of thought and prayer, and encouragement, I've decided to take a position with the Texas Elementary Principals and Supervisors Association in Austin, Texas. This is it for me, my very last day. I know, I'm dropping off my computers and my last form of communication, so I don't want to give it all back. Thank you so much for what you've done. You're a good man. Good luck to you. Hey, I appreciate it very much. No problem. Enjoy right. working with you. Ladies, oh my God. That's for the iPad. Okay. My laptop, although there's a little thing on here that's been sticking up for like forever. Thank you, this is my last day. Thank you so much. There we go. <laughs> and that should be it. All right. Bye bye again. You have a great year next year. It was a very difficult decision for me, but I've grown to a spot where I could maybe have some more positive influence on a greater scene, maybe, than I can as a principal. <laughs> we'll see you later. Bye. Bye bye. I don't want to start reminiscing because I've already done all my, uh, my crying is already over. So <laughs> at least I thought it was it kind of a, a little bit emotional today, but um, before the coffee and, but you know, it's uh, time to go on with another chapter uh, of helping out uh, kids in education. We need to sit down and figure out what works and what doesn't. I don't care what side you're on. You can be on any side. As long as you put kids first, that's all that matters. And if you sit down and say, what can we learn, what's best from your policies and practices that can help improve our future? 
Now that is definitely coming from both sides. And you can hear teachers and teachers unions and different groups saying, we know that things are dramatically changing. We know things are no longer the same. What can we do to make things better? That's the same thing that the reformers are saying. When I was in ninth grade, we were part of this program, uh, Project Lead the Way, and that basically gave an insight on biomedical science. Es una bendición muy grande del Señor. Cuántos padres no quisieran que sus hijos salieran igual que tú, mira. I'm going to be going to Texas A&M, and I graduated with my associates and with 75 college hours. Levántalo, Jenny. My college hours are going to transfer to A&M. And I'm going to enter as a freshman, but I'm going to be classified as a junior. So I'm going to need maybe two or two and a half more years to finish my, my bachelor's in biomedical science. I want to go to medical school and specialize in cardiology. It is now my distinct honor to present to you our valedictorian, Jennifer Gonzalez. I open my eyes and I find myself lying next to my little sister in the back of our old Jeep. I look outside and all I see is the sun rising while my parents are working in a field of peach trees. My childhood was filled with such days. My parents would wake up early, strap their sleeping children securely into their seatbelts and head off to another day full of continuous hard work. I can still remember those quiet days when I would observe my parents nourish those peach trees. Little did I know that those trees would represent what my life is today. Just as my parents so diligently nourished those trees, our parents and those who love us have nourished us and been supportive throughout our lives and our academic careers. But what we have achieved so far only proves that anything is possible if we desire it with all our heart. My fellow graduates, Never let anyone say to you that you are not capable of reaching your goals. No one said that achieving excellence is easy. If not, everyone would be doing it. Setting a goal and overcoming the challenges standing between you and that goal is a great accomplishment. We have already come this far, but this is only a stepping stone for a new beginning. The time has arrived to begin a new journey and take the next big step towards our future. We can accomplish great things as long as we keep working hard, fertilizing our dreams. At times we will fail, but we will not hesitate to get back up. Life is full of surprises, and our reactions will define the individuals we will become. Go and spread the roots of strength, and make a difference by helping others. Spread the fruit of the Spirit, love, knowledge, and courage. Remember that your next step will determine how fruitful you will be. Define yourself, shine, stand out, Make yourself exceptional among all others. Thank you. Well, Texas has a new governor for the first time since 2002. Voters chose Republican Greg Abbott over Democrat Wendy Davis. In the lieutenant governor's race, Republican Dan Patrick defeated Letitia Vanderpute 58% to 39%.